in your Bibles tonight, Proverbs chapter 11. When we think of someone who is wise, it's, it's different than the way the Lord thinks of the people that are wise. The world would say that some of our bankers are wise, or some of our salesmen are wise, or some of our educators, or some of our doctors are wise. If you look to the church, you would say that the church would say there's some pastors that are wise and the wise and deacons that are wise, and that young man or that young lady is a wise person. But God says in this book of Proverbs, chapter 11 and verse 30, these words, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. It's very interesting that the Bible identifies Christians as being different people. And one of the things that he identifies us as is that we are soul winners. It's very interesting. He that winneth souls is wise. And he recognizes us as coming to different levels and places in our Christian life as being soul winners. He that winneth souls is wise. I can remember a lot of years ago, a doctor gave a testimony. He was in the pastor school of Hiles, and this has been a lot of years ago, and he talked about his patients, and he talked about when he would meet with them, that part of his discussion with them was not only to talk about their physical needs or condition, but he was talking about, about their soul and seeing them to be saved. What, a, what an interesting, what an interesting stand of the way to do that. It's very interesting as we think about a soul of a man. The soul is the focus of, of God the Father. Um, that spiritual part of man that makes him different and like yet unto God is the soul of man. A doctor in France has determined that he had figured out the weight of a human soul. And he, he determined with a very sophisticated set of scales that the soul of a man weighs 21 grams. I don't know about that. I don't know if there's a weight to a soul, but I know there's a worth to a soul. Amen. That God sees you and I, and he looks at us, and he sees our soul. And I don't know much that he cares as much about how it weighs as much as how it's worth, amen. It's worth more than all the riches of the world, amen. For what shall it profit a man if he could gain all of the world, the natural riches, the, all the riches, no matter if it was natural resources or what kind of wealth it might be, if you could put it in one pile and you put the soul of one little being, that worth of that soul is more valuable than any all, in all the riches of the world. Your soul is more important, my friend, than any limb in your body. Have you ever thought about that? Uh, the book of Matthew, chapter 5 and verse 29. Listen to these words. If thy right hand offend thee, cut it off. That's pretty clear and gruesome all. Okay, if you look at your right hand and that's keeping you from being saved, and he said you ought to cut it off. Well, that's, that's really bold. And cast it from thee. Why, Lord? For it is, for it is profitable for that one of thy members should perish and not that the, the whole body should perish in hell. He said, your soul is more important than any piece or any part of your physical body. Your soul is the only reason that Jesus would come. The world and, and believe, my friend, his eternal fellowship with the Father is simply because of the man's soul just because of a man's soul. It's interesting the death of Christ was a substitutionary death for the souls of men. That's the only reason that he came, because he was taking your place and my place and our places on the cross. I want you to know when it talks about he that went as souls is wise, it's not, not talking about a, a soul, my friend, that's without hope. These souls are not hopeless. They're just lost. They're not without a hope. They're just lost. Like you and I, we were not without hope. We were just lost, just lost. But they can be saved. God has not determined that they should remain lost. God is not willing that any soul should remain lost. They are, but they live in a land of hope. These souls, my friend, can be won, but it'll take a soul winner. He that winneth souls is wise, and God identifies them, and he said, there's a soul winner, there's a soul winner, that's a Christian, that's a soul winner, that's a person that brings souls to me, a soul winner. Can I say that these unsaved souls, my friend, live in a land of hope, but if there's not someone after them, 
my friend, they're hopeless, you know. I've got some of my neighbors in particular that I'm praying for those men, and I'm praying for them by name, and I'm praying for them regularly. My friend, they're not without hope because they got somebody after them. I'm after their soul. It takes a while to get close to them and get them, my friend, to come to a place and point to listen. Uh, but, it, my friend, they're not without hope. They, have, they live in a, a land of hope, but, but we're after them. But the hopeless person is a person that has nobody that cares for them, that nobody's after them. Now, that's, that's a hopeless soul, that nobody's after them. Have you ever prayed for somebody that you want to be saved? Have you ever prayed that God would send them a believer with boldness, they'd witness to him? You know, have you ever prayed like that for your, your loved ones that need the Lord? Can I say that these people, my friend, are only live in the land, my friend, of, of hopelessness if they don't have somebody after them? They are waiting. They're waiting for some to talk to them about their soul. They're just waiting. They just, they have nothing else to do but wait. In this lost condition, they're just, just waiting, just just waiting. God has a master plan, my friend, to reach every soul. There's not a soul of any nation, of, every, of any nation of all the world that God doesn't have a plan for them to be saved. I talked to a missionary from Spain this week, and I wanted to say to him, man, that's a difficult country, but I didn't. Because I listened to this missionary, and he talked to me about the, the souls of men that he had a burden to reach. He had a burden for them. And though that country, at a whole, my friend, is a a cold country to the gospel. But to him, he's going to a land of hope. He's going to find those souls that he can touch and reach and make a difference. God has a master plan, and he repeated it some five times, and he gave it to the Christians. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded thee, and whatsoever, and, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Acts chapter 1, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the world. Amen, he said. And it's interesting, my friend, that you and I, my friend, have, have a responsibility to win souls that it'll take me and it'll take you. Um, to win souls, it'll take us to be soul winners in every place of every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. And some of the places we end up and that we are invited into, my friend, we don't understand why. And sometimes the only reason is to be that we might be a light. We might be a soul conscious, soul winners. To win souls, my friend, will take effort. First of all, we use the word one. We use the word win. A bridegroom has won this bride. The sports, we say that team won the game. They won. They brought them back. They brought the victory. You know, I, I think we must be careful. It'll take some effort, and it'll take some constructive effort. Sometimes we feel that we're waiting for the Holy Spirit of God just to lead us. And there's no doubt about it. The Lord led Philip specifically to leave the revival and go to speak to the eunuch. No doubt about it. There's no question about it. But my friend, sometimes, my friend, God doesn't always specifically lead. There was a time when that that theological thinking went to our church, well, I, I want to witness to that person, but I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to lead me. Sometimes we're waiting for a voice, my friend, when we've got the verse, amen. We've got the truth, and there's sometimes, my friend, beyond the voice, my friend, beyond the verse, my friend, there'll be that voice that'll direct, direct us specifically and direct us to ensure it. One Monday uh, evening, I come in, and I was fussing in the barn, and I, I come in, and cleaned up, and Suge said, where are you going? I'm, I said, I've got to go make a visit. I went to make the visit, and it was quite a ways from where we lived. It was actually about 17 miles, and I got down there. Knowing the Lord specifically led me to that place in that time, no doubt about it, the Lord worked about my heart, and I got down there, and I said, knocking on the guy's door, realizing he wasn't home, I'm saying, Lord, you led me here. What is this? Lord, there's no doubt about it that you led me here. And I, and I was talking to the Holy Spirit of God as he was there with me. And I said, well, if I've come this far, then I, what I need to do is I need to, I need to visit the closest one to me. And that's when I went and knocked on the door and that man met me at the door. And he, his mouth almost dropped when I identified myself for who I was. And he said, I prayed that God would send me a priest today. And that's when Paul and Marty Gosink were saved. 
I'm saying that sometimes, my friend, we're waiting to be led by the Holy Spirit of God, and sometimes he'll lead us. But sometimes, my friend, it's not the voice, my friend, of the Spirit of God. It's the verse, my friend, that commands us to go into all of the world. We must understand that, my friend, that we must not forever just be waiting for the emotional movement upon you or I. And that is real, and it does happen. But, my friend, that's not the only time we're to be the soul winner. To many Christians, my, my friend, we are sitting around waiting for the movement of emotion, for the soul of people, my friend, and they're being lost. We got family, and got relatives, and we got friends, and we got neighbors that are, we're waiting for God to move us, and that's a part of it. But my friend, we're already to be the witness to him. We're already to be there. Many who are waiting for this message of the voice of the Holy Spirit right now have people in hell who could have been saved and would have been saved. But people were waiting for some Holy Spirit voice to move them when they already had the verse. You know, understand with me that sharing your faith is a command. It's not, it's not a feeling. It's not emotion. It's a part of the Christian life that we come to the place, my friend, where we are mature and we are spiritual and we're strong and we follow, my friend, not the emotions of the Christian life and the movement of the Spirit of God only, but we have the commandments of God, the instructions of God that become a part of our life. Some, my friend, uh, don't show effort because they're concerned about having the fear of having false professions. And the words are used in, in Bible college, picking them green. Have you ever heard those terms? Picking them green, getting the Christian getting someone saved when they're not ready yet, too green. They're afraid that they'll get someone, my friend, to trust Christ before God is ready for him to be saved. Really, is that a possibility? Can, can we get somebody saved so early, my friend, that, that God was not ready for them to be saved? Picking them green. Oh, I think it needs to be a genuine concern because some folk can go in and tear up a vineyard that would have had a lot of fruit, and others will go in and the, the fruit weren't, wasn't quite ripe yet, but they just hastened and they encouraged the ripening. And, and they'll go back and they'll, they'll pick the fruit, but they won't tear the vines up on the way through. They won't tear the trees up on the way through. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. The problem is not the harvest. The problem is you and I, <coughs> the labors that we need to learn how to handle the fruit. And if we get there and that fruit's not quite right or not quite ready, then we recognize that and then we realize that. And we might go away, but we're coming back. <laughs> Amen. We're waiting, my friend. We're, we're putting things in order, recognizing, having ability to recognize. Travis has never heard this before, but I'll tell him something tonight that he has never heard about his soul. You know, very few people have ever said, when I had my hand on the doorknob, if you got time, I'd like to be saved. You know, I never tried to win him that night, as I did almost every other time before that, because he made a commitment to come to church. That's why that night I didn't, because he made a commitment to come to church because that spiritual soul was making progress, and so I left it. Yesterday, in a call with Gabe, went to the house, and the guy knew us as I got there. I didn't recognize him at all. I didn't know who he was, and he said, I'm going to Canada with you guys. And I thought, wow. I talked to him about his soul as his fiance was there, and he went back, and I questioned really if he really understood or was really safe. But nonetheless, that's not between me only. It's between him and God. But nonetheless, I just backed up because I know he's going to a place where Brother Travis, he'll hear and he'll be moved by the Spirit of God. Amen. Now, if, I, if he wasn't going, and if I didn't know that was going to happen, he was excited and overcome about going, he could hardly stand still talking about it. Now, I would have went farther about his soul. Does that make good sense to you? I'm talking about being wise with souls. And, and I think we need to be cautious that sometimes we back off from people that we think, my friend, is not ready to be saved. When I called on Eugene Russell that night being challenged by evangelists that come through our way, I was just convinced that Eugene Russell would tell me, just like he, he told so many in so many services at the invitation time, no, no, not one, not two, but years of a life of saying no to the gospel message. I was just convinced of that. And so when I went in and talked about his soul and talked about how that God had led him specifically on my heart, when I asked him if he wanted to be saved, he got up from his chair from his couch he was on, began to get on his knees. And man, was I a long ways off. 
man, was I way off, way, way, way wrong. I was way wrong. And so sometimes we measure the, the, the ripeness, ripeness, my friend, of a soul by what we think and by what we perceive. But they were ready. When I heard that Paul Williams talk about my daddy the night he got saved. He said, you know, I just wanted to... He said because of his vulgarity, because of his language. But who would ever guess that my daddy, half intoxicated with that kind of vocabulary, would be in his heart very hungry and ready to be saved? Who would ever guess that? Who would ever guess that the man that would make you stand outside that last time you came in, in six inches of fresh snow and talk to you through the storm door? Now, that, he was intentionally, intentionally mean to those men. Inten who would ever think, my friend, that, that that soul would be so hungry? And I'm telling you that, my friend, don't make your judgment the only gauge of a man's soul. And go as far as the Holy Spirit of God would lead you. Go as far as, my friend, that the Holy Spirit allow you and allow them to shut the door. Don't you shut the door. Allow them to say no instead of you saying no. Allowing the Holy Spirit of God to do his work and you just be a tenant servant of his. The harvest truly is plenteous, but the labors are few. Sometimes we must understand that the, the power of soul winning is manpower. Pray, therefore, the Lord of the harvest that he would thrust forth labors into the field. So we have a, a challenge, my friend, and there's so many souls, and though they won't all be ripe and they won't all be ready, but the problem is that someone needs to get there because souls in life are ripe and ready at different times than others. I uh, had the funeral service this last year. I say this last year, that's wrong, this year. Of a man and that his son overdosed. And they didn't tell him, and he got there. And then his son had already been passed for hours. But in often times, he'd revived him, and he knew they had the, the narking, everything there. They tried to, re but he'd been passed for a long time. And I thought to myself, you know what? If there's an ever in a time, my friend, when this soul of this man and this family would be ripe, it'd be now. And it's not a family that we haven't worked with. Matter of fact, there's a little boy. He was in the storefront building the very first days of the service. Very first days. And you know what, my friend, that traumatic impact of losing a son to overdose was terrible. But you know, it did not, it all moved him a little bit closer, but not very much his heart. That, that doesn't mean I'm going to give up. But I believe that I watched a man, I watched a family go through one of the most heart-moving events in all of life, losing and burying the son and my friend, that we're not moved to come forward spiritually. That doesn't mean we should quit. It just means that, my friend, I was just not correct on what it was going to take to bring that man's soul and his family to the Lord. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Don't say that. He said, lift up your eyes, look on the fields, for they're white and they're ready for harvest. A soul winner is identified. Nowhere in the Bible does it ever talk about getting a person to trust Christ too soon. Too soon. Never. You'll never find in all of the stories that, my friend, that from the outside, from the world side, my friend, there was pressure in such a way, my friend, that people, my friend, would bring someone to Christ too soon. Too soon. I got a text from my friend David Glass in Montana. He says he's a great pastor except for during hunting season. And he hunts everything in the world. Everything in the world. Great guy. A great, great man. The text read simply like this. He said, you know, I've got one of the men that was saved in Hillsborough in my office. We're talking about his experiences. His name was Gary Sharp. I want you to know that Gary Sharp got saved because someone visited the wrong address. Amen. The wrong address. Amen. So we thought the wrong address. So we thought the wrong house. So we thought the wrong person. The Bible never talks about a person, my friend, who gets saved too soon. No, just the contrary. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. So understand and realize with us that, my friend, that today is a day for people to be saved. They might not be ready. And though the gospel message was preached this morning and it's found its way, its way into the hearts of people, they didn't probably move as we desire, as we'd like. My friend, but today was a day for those people to be saved. 
It wasn't that God wasn't ready. It wasn't my friend that the cross wasn't ready. It wasn't that the blood wasn't enough. It wasn't that the Holy Spirit wasn't present. It wasn't that the Holy Spirit wasn't speaking and knocking and waiting for them to be saved. It wasn't none of that. It was their condition and their choice and their matter. Can you say amen with me? Just the contrary, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, the day is the day of salvation. Some of the great, great people were saved at young and tender ages. I read about John R. Rice and that he being saved at nine. I read about Bob Jones Sr., and sometimes we don't, we don't hear much about that generation that's passed before us, but Bob Jones and John R. Rice, great, powerful, mighty, mighty men, mighty people. And he was that saved at the age of 11. Or the Shuggy Lamb that was so young, wasn't sure if it's eight or nine. If you look at her writing, you can't tell because it wasn't all the way developed just as yet as a little tiny lady. Or you think of the Stacy Burns at the ages of four. But one thing needs to be for sure that no matter who they are or where they are, what age they come to our church, that if they're in the junior church or, or in the junior department, middle school department, or the, or the high school department, or the college class, or the young professionals, or adults, or no matter who they are, there ought to always be a clear presentation of the gospel. And a wonderful, warming welcome, my friend, for every soul and any soul to be saved. Amen? It ought to be that way. We must, my friend, give a clear presentation of the gospel of Christ. Amen? It must be. It's got to happen. It must be. That's the plan. You know, no matter what it is, no matter where we go, there must be. There must be a message of Christ, sometimes much stronger than others, but always the message, always the invitation, my friend, for those that are not to become saved. Amen. We ought not rush, my friend. The Holy Spirit is something else that I think that we deal with as people, that we said we need to give the Holy Spirit time, and we do. And our church is very careful about that. And we're very careful not just to talk about e easy believism, and some of you might not even understand what I'm saying, and that's good. That's not bad. That's good. But we give people time to be real and to be genuine and to make their decision and make that. We, we're not interested in a number. We're not interested in a card. We're not interested in a fact. We're not interested in the, the, the pill we should announce. That some, we want people that when they leave, they know they're saved. We want their lives to be eternally changed. I want to say that you're saved. I want them to know, my friend, that they are saved and that they're eternally, my friend, ready to stand with the Lord. And they'll have the same experience that you and I have of being changed and transformed and never being the same. Amen. I turn to my invitation. It'll be pretty quick. I say this. We must learn to care about them if they will be able to care for themselves. I think it's a good statement. I want to give it to you again. We must care for them if they will ever be able to care for themselves. Unless you present the gospel to them, unless you take, my friend, and give to them the message so they can understand, my friend, they will never care for themselves. They cannot care for themselves unless, first of all, we care for them. I go back in my verses to the book of Acts in chapter 1. But ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria unto the othermost. Can I say that a soul winner is not somebody that shows up once a month on a Tuesday night? And that's a very important piece, my friend, of the Great Commission. To go on a mission trip, my friend, is scriptural, and you can find verses in the Bible from that. But it begins with the Jerusalem, Judea, the Samaria, the uttermost. So where you are to the farthest extent of where you can go. And God said that the Christian has a responsibility not to do one area of life, but to do all areas of life. That we're to be a part, my friend, of those that we know and are very familiar in love. That we should be a missionary, that we should be a gospel, a messenger, a witness, my friend, to those, my friend, that are our own loved ones and are as close as anybody in all of the world. I love to witness the first message of Jesus in the ears of my little babies. I did that when they couldn't understand and they didn't know. And it was a beginning, my friend, of an end that would continue to replicate throughout the journey of their life. But my friend, not only those that we know the most, but those, my friend, that we would know and call as friends. Those people that, my friend, are those that we work with, those people that serve us, and those people that we serve them. And so that perimeter, that, rec that circle as it spreads out, that we're a living witness, that it starts with those that are closest to us and know us the best, and as it spreads out and to the people, my friend, that we don't know. But we can visually see them, we can see them, we've seen them, but we don't know their name or who they might be or who they are, and then yet farther it goes on out to people that we've never seen. 
I shook hands with people today that I haven't seen for a long time. A man reminded me this morning. He said, you remember when you met me the first time? I said, brother, I, sir, I can't remember. He said, the first time you've seen me, you asked me and my wife, are you saved? Can I say that that ring, that circle, my friend, of our witness, my friend, needs to expand, and there needs to be effort in every life to reach those that are closest to this, and that yet, my friend, those that are farthest away from us. And those that have different skin and different hair and different culture and different language and different than you and different than I, my friend, that have an eternal soul. And we as a Christian have been given a responsibility and a power, my friend, and enabling, my friend, that we can do it all at the very same time. The very same time. That we need to be a piece and a part of all the projects of reaching out as far as we can reach. You know, these... Uh, pennies that were raised, these $500, $700, I'm not certain about the amounts of it, but that were sent down to those, to that baby church in that Dayton area just to, to love those people that come through that storm a while back. Can I say that's all pieces and parts of doing all that we can and all that we should? Can I say that, my friend, we are to be a living witnesses? We must care about them if they will ever be able to care for themselves. I heard of a story that becomes so burdened for her daughter, her teenage daughter, that she went into her bedroom in the night and woke her up. Woke her up. She was alarmed that her mother woke her up. Mom, it's the middle of the night. What are you doing? And as the mother began to share by her tears, my friend, the daughter was moved and come to know the Lord with mother sitting on the side of the bed in the middle of the night. Can I say that, my friend, that I'm convinced, listen to this statement, I'm convinced that very few souls could ever be lost. Now think about this. It's profound, it's deep, but it's real. Very few soul, unsaved souls would ever be lost if they had someone that truly loved them and tried to win them. Very few. You think about that. The problem is we don't have enough people that are genuine he that goeth forth and weepeth, bearing precious seed, shall doubtless come again with rejoicing. That's that if you go with realness and genuineness, my friend, after the souls of men, can I say you will have fruit? Amen. You say, but pastor, I'm not, I, I'm not comfortable. Uh, neither am I. When I make my visits, I always start on the easy ones. If I got a choice of the sequence of the visits and where I'm going, I'm starting on the easy ones. Amen. The ones that got cats and not dogs, too, as well. Amen. You with me? Amen. Or you have to call, climb posts, right, Dean? Four by four poles when the Dobermans are chasing after you. And there's not enough poles, and you're not quick enough to get up, you know. Can I say that, my friend, I, I'm just like you. I'm just as human as you are. I don't like to have when somebody say no to me or be cool or cold to me. We were visiting some years ago, a lot of years ago. Matter of fact, I'd visited in the day, and I was visiting on down through Newmarket, and I knocked on a bee's nest, and I didn't know it. I had no idea what I was knocked on. I had no idea. But this man was very angry, and some things had happened with life, and he was very angry, and he was very cold to me. And, man, he was, he was ferocious to me, and he was just very in every way as mean as you could be. And I said, well, sir, listen, God bless you. I mean, sorry, I could tell he was really fervent, and what I did not know is that that same night, I don't know how it all happened, but God sent another messenger there to witness, and some of our people went there, and that man was cranked up even more than when I visited him because he, he was so angry against God, they followed right straight through behind me. Sometimes we wonder about that. Sometimes God said, now, this guy's really angry, but I really love this guy. Would you go back one more time? And uh, Mike Delaney was here then, and... Uh, you know, he tried to bring the man where he needed to be. What I'm trying to say, I don't know about that, but I do know this. I do know that, my friend, that every soul needs someone to love him. Every soul needs someone to care about him and go after him and not stop with him. Not, not stop. Not give, don't give up. The soul winner is identified. I, I'm going to do this. The sweetest of these three that I'm going to ask to come forward is, uh, uh, she's a little lady. And these are just the stories I've heard just in the last three days of our people winning somebody to the Lord. And I'm going to ask them to come. Um, 
Brother Gabe, would you come? And you share, Brother Travis, I want you to share, but I want to talk to you about, about walking through that man that you want to the Lord. Just come ahead. And then Miss Mills, where are you at? Come on, darling girl. Amen. And when you see these two geezers and you see this pretty girl, you can see there's a difference between beauty, amen, and, and, and bronze. Amen. Amen. Number three. Thank you, Elijah. Thank you very much. Now, these are just stories that I've just heard, okay? These are, these are fresh stories that I just heard, amen? Just heard this one this morning. And you know what? You would, you'd, you'd never believe how many of these young ladies and young men are, are conscious about souls and conscious about people, okay? I want to give you this. You're not scared, are you? No, you're not. Just quiet. Okay, now tell me about your friend that you told me. What's her name? Lily. And how long has she been your friend? About two years. Yeah, and how do you know her? At school. At school. And so you see her in the summertime too? Yes. Yeah. So tell me, how long have you been talking to her about her soul? Um, not long, about a year. Yeah. And so tell me how she got saved. Tell us where and tell us how that happened. Amen. And so you talked her through it on the phone, over the phone, and she got saved over the phone? Yeah. Isn't that neat? Amen. Don't ever, ever underestimate these young people with it. You. Thank you very much. I'm glad you cared about her soul. Thank you, sweetheart. Thank you. Okay, Trav. You never knew that the reason I didn't try to win you that night is because you promised to come to church. You never knew that, did you? You never knew that the first time you told her. Yeah. I, all those years, I've had that in my heart all my all these years. But that's why, because I just backed up. Because you were always a man of your word. You were always from the very beginning. You just we could always always know that about you. You know. I still remember you talking about that night, talking about what about the Lord was there all the time and knocked on our heart. Yeah. And we have to open. Yeah. Go back in your mind. How long have you been going on church-wide visitation? After you got saved, how long before you started with that track? We probably started going on visitation about maybe three or four months after we were saved. Yeah. Maybe less than that, I don't know. Yeah. We got involved really quick, you know. Yeah. Lord blessed us. So. Amen. Back then, we went once a week. Amen. We want to go 12 times a year as a church. That's all we go now. As a church, you know, as a church wide. Yeah. Amen. Well, Trav, talk to us about, I know I just heard your story. You just shared it just a little bit the other night. But, but take us back how you met this guy. Well, this guy's name was Daniel. I worked with him sometimes. Uh, working in the woods, marking trees all day long. And, uh, he really had a lot of health problems and stuff. Had like uh, lost half of it. Had some kind of a strange disease in one of his lungs. He lost one of his lungs. Uh, he has a real will to work. And he's a hard worker. And so I get to working with him. And so I started asking him about the Lord. I worked a couple of days, long days with him. Got to talking to him. And uh, I asked him if he's saved. And he said, no. He said, I'm not. And I said, Daniel, in your health condition, what do you think is you should get saved? So, you know, he just kind of shrugged it off and it went on for a good while. And I had worked with him for a couple, three weeks, and then uh, on visitation, I guess it been two, three weeks ago now, a last visitation on Tuesday night, I didn't get to go because I'd been a long day in the woods and I was so dirty and had paint all over me. And I was so sweaty, and I thought, well, I'll just make a call sometime this week. That night, I'm sorry, Wednesday night, he called me and he said, can you come over to my house? He said, I want to get saved. And I said, 
said, do you want me to come tonight? And he said, no, be at my house at 8 o'clock in the morning. Tell him I couldn't be here this morning. And so I planted those seeds. I didn't even know he had ever grow. You know, I didn't know he'd ever get saved. But like the preacher said, you never give up. Never give up. And what a blessing. He's 38 years old. He's got three boys. His wife and kids go to church all the time. And so I asked him if he went last week. I talked to him last night. And he said, no. He says, I'm building a deck for my brother-in-law. I said, are you going today? And he says, no, I'm going to try to finish that deck because I've got a lot of things to do. I said, Daniel, you need to go to church. I said, I'm going to bring you a Bible. He said, well, if you bring me a Bible, mark it. If you bring it to me, I'll read it. Wow. Amen. That's great. That's great. <laughs> Thanks, brother, for being a soul winner. Amen. Is there anybody here in this service tonight that Travis has been there and won you to the Lord or been on visiting you before you're saved? Is there anybody here tonight in this service that Travis has visited you before you're saved? Anybody here that Travis got you in church? You see that one back there? Yeah. See, Frank? <laughs> I see it. I knew you'd have some. Amen. Thank you, Travis. You can be seated if you want. Gabe's pretty quiet. Y'all, go ahead, give him a hand. That's okay. Do that. I'm just, I'm just Gabe's pretty quiet around here, and he's got a lot of words, and it's been really fun this summer to watch Gabe and uh, to watch him grow and become concerned for people and uh, um, the deep conversations that we've had about soul winning and visiting, and he's so alert. Uh, he was with me yesterday making that call and uh, seeing me back off when this young man said he's coming to Canada and seeing, seeing that happen. We talked about that. It's just interesting. Uh, tell us about this lady that I just, just heard about that, that got saved. Well, her kid went to the outreach that St. Croix has got talent, so it was just a visit to encourage them to come to church. Um, so I went and named the mom that I ended up talking to. And she said her kid um, is the one that always talks about Jesus and gets them to start praying around the table. So I was telling Pastor the other day how important it is that people underestimate kids. They can be like they reflect the light of Jesus, and they're really big influences in their family. And just because of that, we have the opportunity to go visit that house and connect with her and let her do her word. Amen, buddy. Yeah. Was, was she filled with a lot of questions? Or? A lot of questions, yeah. She said she was saved when she was six. Um, she thought she was, you know, the things she did in life was too bad and everything. So it was kind of a reassurance of her salvation um, to let her know that Jesus died for their sin, you know, everything that she did, everything, all the mistakes she looked after, um, that's what Jesus died for, and she put the complete trust in him, and, um, and she knows what she's doing when she dies, she doesn't have to continuously do it over and over, Amen. it's a one-time thing. Amen. That's good, amen. Thank you, Brother Gabe. Thank you for caring for those people. Those are just three that I've heard of. We hear of them time to time. Maybe there's somebody else here that has showed somebody how to be saved, got the chance to be the soul winner, and, and you just like to share that with us. Is there anybody else that would like to share with us? Anybody else? I'd love to hear these stories. They bring courage to all of us and hope to all of us that have unsaved hate people we're witness to. Amen. Okay, would you stand with me, please? As we close tonight, I remind you that we must care about them if, if they will be able to care for their own self. And so, if we're going to be the, the soul winner we need to be, then we need to be prepared in knowing how to lead somebody to the Lord. We need to be prepared not only to have the verses in order, but we need to be pre prepared to be bold enough to speak out, to overcome our own personal, our own personal weaknesses and fears that, that we all have. And then, my friend, we must, my friend, not quit. And so sometimes you'll ask yourself, well, how did I get here, or why are they there? Why are they my neighbor? Why are they my service person? Why do I see them every week? Why is it? And sometimes God's put them in, in your life to be that light and to be the voice of how to be saved. Amen. And so be that. Let's pray tonight. Shall we do that?
Our Father in heaven, we are very grateful and we thank you so very much that there was a somebody, there was a somebody that was a ready witness to us. And they cared about our soul. They cared about our eternity. And Lord, we thank you that you've given us the ability to make a difference in the lives of everyone around us. And so, Father, these people that are around us that we see and that we know are not hopeless unless we fail. So, Father, help us. Help us to be prepared and ready, a ready witness, a ready soul winner. Help us to be soul winners. In Jesus' name we pray and ask, and amen, and amen. We're going to have a brief invitation, and as they prepare to do that, first of all, if you're here, and as we talk about being saved, if you're here and not saved, then don't pass this opportunity by. You say yes to the Lord. As I tell you that, my friend, you cannot get saved too early. You cannot. You cannot be. The Holy Spirit's at work, and he'll give you help. The Lord's blood is ready to be the complete forgiver of your soul. If you're here tonight and you just, as a Christian, just want to be that witness, maybe God's put on your heart a particular soul, something that, that you know you need to do, somebody that you need to talk, then, then tonight say yes to that voice, not just yes to the verse. All of us need to say yes to the verse and then we need to say yes to the voice as specifically the Spirit of God would lead us about certain people, certain souls. Say yes to the Lord. Say yes to Him.